Thank you. I want to begin by uh, changing the title of my talk uh, from the origin of aneuploidy to the origin of the origin of aneuploidy, because we all know what the origin of aneuploidy is, uh, the presence of or loss of a chromosome. I want to speak to you about the origin of those uh, chromosome kinds of changes. So why do we want to study aneuploidy in the first place? Well, because we know that uh, aneuploidy is the underlying cause of many different uh, human diseases uh, related to implantation failure, pregnancy loss, infertility. It is the cause of congenital malformations and in many instances later in life, um, the cause of cancer. So understanding the cause of aneuploidy will not only lead to improved testing and possible prevention, but as was suggested in the very last uh, session, uh, the possibility of potential cure. So understanding how aneuploidy comes into being, I think is probably one of the most significant challenges that we uh, have to face uh, in the near future. The um, natural cause of, of events is illustrated in this slide, um, emphasizing meiosis one and meiosis two, in which the homologous chromosomes separate in meiosis one, and in meiosis two, the chromatids uh, uh, of the centromeres separate. Um, and there are a number of different mechanical mechanisms that lead to a diff, uh, uh, aneuploidy. And one form, which is called a true non-disjunction, it, it occurs when both homologous uh, and centromeres move in the same direction. Um, and then in the meiosis two, um, they separate. So true non-disjunction is one of three major mechanisms leading to aneuploidy. The second that's been referred to from time to time is precocious separation of sister chromatids in which instead of the separation of the uh, centromeres, uh, one uh, member of uh, the pair uh, separates and acts independent of each other and will go to the same pole as the other homologous chromosome. And the third mechanism for uh, creating aneuploidy is referred to as achismatic non-disjunction in which there is no crossing over and both homologs move in the same direction. Now, in fact, true non-disjunction represents a very small part of the contributing to the mechanisms leading to aneuploidy. True non-disjunction, which is the dominant phrase people use to describe the origin of aneuploidy, only may occur in about one or two percent. And the major, and it's really referred by Alan Handyside on a number of occasions at this conference, uh, as well as others, that premature pre-division of sister chromatids form the major mechanism leading to aneuploidy. And achasmata, as achasmata uh, occurs about eight or nine percent. And I've tried to summarize it here in another way. And if you look at A, starting in the upper um, left-hand corner, um, Angel was, in the 1990s, was really the first to point out that premature separation, pre-division, was a major cause of aneuploidy, and that these other causes um, relating to um, 
altered chromosome content of the gametes uh, related to w the location of the chiasma. In other words, if there was a loss of chiasma, uh, the uh, non-disjunction would basically be enhanced. Or if you lost cohesion around and in the centromere, uh, you would also set up, as is shown in the right-hand column, uh, other mechanisms for the origin of um, aneuploidy. And finally, they, another form was re of, of, of causing aneuploidy was raised. This is the classical example of uh, conventional chromosome uh, disjunction in, in which the homologs pair and they, then they separate and, uh, and polar body formation, all of which are familiar to you. But Alan Handyside raises this uh, another mechanism called reverse segregation. Uh, this is sort of a complicated side, but the origin may be the loss of centromeric cohesion or the precocious separation of cystochromatids. And what happens is that the homologous chromosomes, in a sense, do not necessarily separate in meiosis one, and you have a representative of each chromosome, and then subsequent to that, they separate again into uh, polar body one and two. The upshot of that is illustrated on the left-hand corner, uh, left-hand, uh, excuse me, my right-hand side, in which you can restore euploidy, but also can create uh, two forms of uh, aneuploidy, and the one that would be of clinical consequence would be the one to the extreme right, where you would have a disomic egg form. So although reverse segregation can restore the normal chromosome balance, it also has the capacity of creating an aneuploid oocyte. Now, the papers refer to this as something frequent. I'm not sure they give a number, but uh, it would not surprise me if this were not part of the premature separation of chromatids as well as the uh, instances where there's no chiasma formed uh, to create uh, an unbalanced uh, uh, gamete. What I really want to focus on in the moments that are available to me in terms of the origin of aneuploidy is the molecular basis to causing aneuploidy. And I've listed three major molecular processes that have been repeatedly suggested in the literature over many years. One of them is the gradual depletion of cohesion, uh, and we would use advancing maternal age as the clinical expression of, of the consequence of that gradual depletion. The important role of chiasmata in stabilizing uh, chromosomes so that they again move properly. And the third uh, aspect would be that there was some defect in the spinal, uh, spindle rather, assembly checkpoint, sometimes referred to as the microtubule kinetochore attachment. Somehow this process is impaired and the consequence is aneuploidy. But when you begin to look at these multi-systems, these of cohesion and spindle assembly checkpoints, you begin to quickly get lost because there are a whole host of other elements comprising the cohesion system, comprising the spindle assembly checkpoint that interact with one another. And so that you can uh, see that one is dependent on the other and that there is an, indeed 
some kind of chain of events that occur um, to ensure proper chromosome segregation. Most recently, critical information about the um, cohesion molecule, that it consisted uh, of, a, of a kind of a chain, um, like a necklace, if you will, consisting of SM SMC1, SMC3, and SCC1, and the entrance, in other words, this uh, and tri uh, triformed um, constituted a chain around the chromosome, the entrance point being uh, at S uh, SMC1 and SMC3, and the exit of the chromosome being at SMC3 and SCC1. So we're beginning to get uh, a better understanding of the mechanics of how these uh, systems operate. But the point is that even this chain that is shown on the right is not an independent agent, and it's dependent on other components of the cohesion system. And it's mo more than just a chicken and an egg, because behind the chicken, behind the egg, there's other things that are going on. And the same can be true for the spinal assembly checkpoint. Each of them has uh, an action, and each of them, in turn, is guarded by another uh, set of um, biochemical events. But in terms of the relationship between uh, the molecular and the mechanical basis for aneuploidy, a whole host of other factors have been suggested that relate to the causation of aneuploidy. Reduced chromosome exchange, persistence of the nuclei in meiosis one, relaxed selection against trisomy, premature physiological aging, aging rather, of female reproductive system, a compromise in the microcirculation, leading to oxygen deficiency and abnormal pH, delayed fertilization and sperm aging, menopausal age, surgical removal or congenital absence of one ovary, women with Turner syndrome, ethnicity, abnormal folate and methyl me metabolism, mitochondrial mutation, accelerated shortening of telomeres. Each of these have been reported uh, to have some kind of an effect on this causation of aneuploidy. And most recently, the last two years, um, a whole set of uh, elements referred to as uh, PP2A, and I've referred here just to one format, CDC55. In order for there to be proper initiation of multiple meiotic events, PP2A has to participate. And what it does, apparently, is monitor multiple meiotic events to ensure their fidelity. It's sort of like a guard at the door, and the process is not to allow to continue until PP2A says everything is okay and you can go ahead. Uh, it prevents cell division before chromosomes will segregate. So PP2A is required for progression through amyosis 1, and in mutant cells in which PP2A has been genetically modified, one such that CBC55 is absent, it, they do not, uh, they remain in a mononuclear, mononuclear state. And we are finding that PP2A is involved in sister chromatin cohesion in meiosis one. It's involved in spindle formation and organization. 
It's involved in microtubule kinetic core attachment. It affects the uh, gene expression of ionic genes. It actually affects DNA replication prior to formal meiosis. It affects the molecules recombination. It actually is responsible for initiating replication, but it's not necessary for its completion. And then to make this particular point, someone's watching BP2A. A CRL4, D DCAF1, which then regulates oocyte maturation and survival, promotes zygotic genomic programming, and degrades BP2A scaffold subunit. So the watchers are being watched. And the watchers who are being watched are watched by other watchers. So I, my assessment, and I realize that this is a, a brief overview, is that the etiology of aneuploidy, in contrast to the simple presence of a missing or extra chromosome, is likely to be multifactorial. I'd like to conclude by discussing with you briefly some of the exceptions to aneuploidy and advanced maternal age. One exception is the sexual differences in the rates of aneuploidy of males and females. So in male meiosis, it appears to only take one unaligned chromosome that will block the entire meiotic progression. In contrast, in oogenesis, the oocyte with one or more misaligned chromosomes can complete meiosis. So in male meiosis, there's a bit more stringency, and the spindle assembly checkpoint in oogenesis seems to be more accepting, more permissive than that of the male. Other exceptions to advanced maternal age. The susceptibility of young mothers of Down syndrome children to aneuploidy and subsequent pregnancy. And that's really been very well combined, confirmed. And do these young mothers really, uh, are they not really uh, young mothers, biologically speaking? Are they really biologically like women of advanced maternal age? Now, you can give that as an answer, but it certainly doesn't give you an answer to the underlying molecular mechanism that uh, create this situation. Um, there, there is some uh, literature which indicates that the live-born prevalence may not continue to increase with advanced maternal age. And these studies have not necessarily been confirmed. Um, and it may be a bias in the sense that uh, pregnancy loss may be higher in the uh, older advanced maternal age patient uh, and therefore give the impression uh, that uh, it is not a straight line relationship between advancing maternal age and Down syndrome. And I don't think enough attention has been given to the role of advanced paternal age because there are at least two papers which at age 40 and 50 claim that 50% of Down syndrome in that age group um, are the result of non-disjunction, using it in a very general sense, uh, of the father's age. So from 40 years of age or older, uh, the contribution uh, to, say, Down syndrome is equal from each partner. Now, despite our use of lots of technology, in the United States, about 65% of Down syndrome live born are to women less than 35 years of age. We know that the risk 
is less, but the fact of the matter is, um, in the past, we always said that the majority of Down syndrome were born of advanced maternal age, and the reason that we saw more Down syndrome alive born in women less than 35 years of age is because they were they dominated the population by science work. But this is not necessarily true in other countries. And I only cited one set. There are other examples from Europe. In England and Wales, only 45% of Down syndrome was born, are born to women 35 years of age. So there are these differences in countries related to possibly uh, aging and use of the technology. This is a very busy slide, and I don't know how uh, well it shows up. And I owe this slide, I'll take blame for it, but, uh, to uh, Peter and, and uh, to Howard. Uh, each of them gave me about half of the data. Um, and the upper, upper square Excuse me. Uh, uh, the upper line uh, with the circle, the solid circle, it shows a, sort of a bimodality. Around 1990, there was a relative increase in the number of to total births, somewhere between 4.1 and 4.2 million. It, by 1990, Six and seven, it was down to less than 3.9, and over the next um, 20, 15 years, uh, it rose to a maximum around 2007, and now it's beginning to drop off. So it's a little bit uh, live births are a little bit of a bimodal distribution, um, and the point is if you follow in the squares the actual num uh, Down syndrome live birth, you find that despite the introduction of carrier screening or first trimester screening, despite the introduction of amniocentesis, despite the introduction of CVS, despite the introduction of pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, the number of live born with Down syndrome actually follows that same bimodal distribution. So the technologies that we, if, if, if the focus is from a population perspective, uh, the impact of the technologies that I've just mentioned have been extremely limited so far. If that's your goal, now, on a personal basis, people make decisions about Down syndrome, uh, testing, not testing, terminating, not terminating pregnancy. But if you're looking at it from a, a public perspective, all those technologies that we've introduced, at least in the United States, it's not going to be true of some European countries, in the United States, it has virtually no impact. And finally, I wanted to point out to you that aneuploidy plays a very important role in evolution. That the ancestral genome was in a, in a circular form, and that it wasn't until multiple linear chromosomes were established that uh, evolution took place, and that was through aneuploidy, gain and loss of a whole chromosome. And actually, it turns out that the first elements in the multiple linear chromosomes were the telomeres. And from an evolutionary point of view, it's the telomeres that gave, which shut down and made segmental infections. And uh, it's the telomere that presumably evolved into the centromere. So it's sort of giving you a bit of a history of, of that. Now, most um, presentations end with a summation of uh, their presentation. Uh, I'm going to end with a series of questions about uh, the origin of aneuploidy. Which specific component 
of which system is the primary source predisposing to aneuploidy. Alternatively, do mutations in different molecular systems and or different meiotic stages account for chromosomally unbalanced gametes? What is the underlying molecular basis for the relationship between maternal age and risk of aneuploidy? What molecular dysfunction accounts for increased paternal risk after 40 to 50 years of age? What accounts for the lower rate of aneuploidy in younger women? And what are the specific molecular events leading to age-related diminution of cohesion and or malfunction of spindle assessment checkpoints? And finally, is there a molecular basis for the threefold risk of, my other, of mothers with a previous aneuploidy conception? What specific environmental conditions are associated with aneuploidy? Is aneuploidy the consequence of centromeric dysfunction? And I bring that last question up because the centromere has a lot to do with microtubule kinetochore formation. It has a lot to do with cohesion. So the centromere may well be the center of actions by the cohesion and by the uh, kinetochore. And finally, from a clinical perspective, I've always been interested to try to account for the differential intrasite survival rate of different aneuploids. So let's take Down syndrome. We know that about 75% of them are lost in the enduring pregnancy and 25% survive. The numbers have been around for a long time. The majority are lost in the first trimester, less so in the second, and the third, even less so. But why do those 25 survive? Is that on the basis of other genetic factors in the background? Or is that just a certain chance of then, uh, in terms of an environmental uh, difference between uh, the surviving and the non surviving? Um, but certainly it's not a simple linear um, um, inverse relationship. The highest and first trimester gets lower and lower because. 25% jumps up again into the live board. So I don't have the answer for the question about the origin of, uh, of uh, aneuploidy, and I think I can say to you uh, it's complicated. <laughs>